What is the greatest moment in history? Some people would say fire, the discovery of fire. Others would say, well, how about the discovery of the wheel? Uh, some would say the Greek civilization, its culture, or maybe Rome and it given us a codified law. The Renaissance gave us so much and impressive. We might also think about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, today we can think of a lot of things we have seen in the 20th century. All kinds of things that have changed our world are great moments. And these were great moments and many, many others. But as believers, as Christians, we should only have one answer. And it is the only true answer. And that answer is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. No other event can even come close to that event. And it is that moment that we come to as we open to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. We have seen that the Word is Jesus Christ, that the Word was in the beginning when all things were made, He was already there. We, can, we, saw, we saw that He was God and that He was face to face with God. We also saw that God has sent a forerunner, sent one to come and tell the world that the Messiah, the light, has come. He said, I'm not the light, but I come to tell you of the light. Well, this morning we're going to see the light. And so if you look at your Bibles down in verse 9, if you're open to chapter 1, beginning it says this, that was the true light, which giveth light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship you, And our worship is to be in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, we are turning to thy truth. We are wanting to know thy truth. We want to be able to believe thy truth. We want thy truth to transform our lives. We want to live by thy truth. And so we ask thee, Heavenly Father, to bless thy truth to our minds, our hearts, and our wills. Holy Spirit, teach us this morning. We do pray, as always, through Christ and in his precious name, amen. 
Now, John tells us that the true light was revealed. He says in verse 9, That was the true life which gives light to every man coming into the world. And who is this light? Well, when we look at this whole passage and when we look at chapter and verse 14 and other places, we know that this light is the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice he says that he is the true light. That is actually uh, means the real, the ideal, the genuine light, not just any light. There's a lot of lights, and people will talk about light uh, and use it in many different ways. But this is the only true, genuine life, eternal life. Jesus is that life. All of the lives in the universe and on earth are nothing in comparison. I think it's interesting. You know, we, we think the greatest light is the sun, right? When, when we get up in the morning and we begin to see that sun and we see it through the day, we say, that's, that's the greatest light we have. Uh, if, if we're outside, for instance, and the sun is shining and maybe we have a, a, a lamp outside and we turn it on, it doesn't seem to do anything, does it? That sun is so incredible. But let me remind you of something that the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that when we're in heaven, there will be no need for the Son because the Son of God will be the light that will shine on everything. That's how great His light is. Not only is that the idea that He is the light that shines on everything, but the light that makes us and allows us to see the truth to see that which is real. As, as Brother Joe prayed this morning, uh, the, what darkness, what gives, moves the darkness? The light. The world is in darkness. The world was in darkness when Jesus came. The world is in darkness today, and yet he is the light. And that light isn't just to uh, give us knowledge, it is to actually share with us the salvation that is in him. And so it is not only light for all things, but it is also spiritual light. And the true light, he says here, is given to everyone. Every person. All without distinction. distinction. Everyone, everywhere in the world. The light is there. Now, those who have not received the written revelation from God, the light, there is the light of creation. The Bible tells us that, that that is part of God's revelation. So when somebody is living in an area and they've never heard the word of God, they've never heard about Jesus Christ, creation itself is God's light to them. Second of all, the Bible tells us that the commandments of God are written on every man's heart. Everybody knows. You can go out throughout this world. You can go to the the, the places that that never have heard about Jesus Christ. You can sit down and study those people and learn from those people and, and talk with those people. And you will find that they have certain light, no matter what they are. Even though they may murder each other, they know they shouldn't murder each other. Even though they may commit adultery, they know they shouldn't commit adultery. They know, they they may not know God, but they know there is a God. They may invent God, because if they don't know God, they need to invent a God. They need to come up with something about God. But there is light that God has given them. God has not left them in total darkness. And if they will respond to that light, God will give them more light. And the more they respond to the light, the more light God gives to them. But if they keep on saying, I don't want the light, I shut off the light, then the light is shut off. (coughs) You know, if you go into a, a room and you have a light there and you say, I don't like the light. 
You go shut it off. And somebody comes back in and says, you know, I'd like to be the light. I want to see things. So they turn the light back on. And you say, but I don't want it. I don't want to see the light. I don't want to be able to see. And you go over and you take the bulb out. They come back in and they said, I want to see. And so they screw the ball back in. And next thing you know, you're still yelling, I don't want the light. And you break the bulb. But you see, the light was available. The light was there. You just keep on, people keep on rejecting it until they sever their conscience. Until they say no to God enough times that in the sense the bulb is broken. Now, God has given the world the light of Christ. No one escapes one or the other of the sources God's light has made available. And the Holy Spirit sees to that. God holds people responsible for the light they have. People people always ask that question, what about the people in... There's always somewhere, right? I don't know if we have anywhere left yet because the light has been penetrating. But there is nowhere. God has made sure that there is some light to them. Now, John also tells us that the true light was resisted. He says that in verse 10, he was in the world, that is the light, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. The Lord saw the light resisted by his own creatures, by his own creation. Think about this. As Jesus walked in the land... And he would look over and he would see a a farmer in his field. Do you realize that he knew who he was? Do you realize that he knew his name? Do you realize that he knew everything about him? Why? Because he had created him. You say, oh, he, he didn't know everybody. You remember when he was in Samaria? Wasn't in Israel. He was in Samaria, and he comes to a well, and he sits by the well, and there's a lady there, a lady he has never met, a lady he had never heard about. He never read about her, knew nothing about her as far as humanly possible, and he's sitting down, and he knows who she is. She knows how many, he knows how many times she's been married. She knows right now he, she's living with somebody who's not her husband. Uh, she, he knows... Uh, how she worships and and what her concepts of worship are and God and all those things. How does he know that? Because he created that woman. He made her. He knew everything about her. Everyone in the world he made and he knew them. He knows you and I. He made us. He formed us. We are his creation. But though he knew them, they didn't know him. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. To John, that was the supreme tragedy and irony of everything. People were rubbing shoulders with God incarnate. God manifested in the flesh and they didn't know who it was. Allison had an interesting experience this week. She was given the opportunity to help a 90-year-old lady. And she was to take her to the DMV and to help her get there and be able to 
get a driver's license. And she helped her and did all that she could, and we won't go into all that story. But later she found out that this lady was a movie star. She didn't even know that. She spent time with her and saw her and all that and didn't even know who she was. And then when she told me who she was, I didn't know who she was. <coughs> Apparently I didn't see that TV series and I didn't see those movies because I looked at the list of them, I didn't see them. <coughs> we can be with somebody or rub shoulders with somebody and not know who they are. But imagine Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes into the world. He walks among men, and they don't know who he is. John will say to them, there is one amongst you you do not know. But despite the rejection of him, the unbelieving world someday, all of mankind living and dead, will acknowledge that Jesus is who he is. If you take your Bibles for a minute and turn to Philippians and chapter 2. <clears throat> when you get to Philippians 2, go down to verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus Christ, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Someday, Everyone, everyone will know and confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior. <clears throat> now the, word, the Lord was resisted not only by his creatures, worse still, he was resisted by his own countrymen. Look at verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Jesus came to the Jewish people, and they did not know who he was. Not only did they not know who he was, they had nothing to do with him. <clears throat> he had been preparing them, God had been preparing them for centuries for his coming, for the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. They knew that. They knew he was going to come. And yet, when he came, they not only didn't know him, they rejected him. The prophets had been foretelling about him. Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. The prophets wrote about me. One, one of the passages that means so much to us is Isaiah 53, when it talks about his crucifixion. They knew that passage. They knew other passages. They, they knew what the Old Testament said. They were looking for him, and yet when he came, they said, we will have nothing to do with him. Why? Because their religion had become cold and dead and formal. What they needed was one to breathe life in those dead bones. And so John the Baptist had risen to announce to them, to tell them he was one and speaking from the wilderness. It says in verse 6, 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was to bear witness of that light. <coughs> he was kind of like a searchlight. He was like that light bulb in a dark room. He came to turn, not to be the light, but <coughs> to show them where the light was. To come and say, look, there it is. Turn it on. He's right there with you. And that's what we all have to do. The light has come. He's there. He's available. He wants us to come to him. But will we reject that light, or do we accept the light? But here's the problem. They were not the kind of Messiah that they wanted. And I believe today one of the problems is that the world doesn't want the kind of Messiah who came. <clears throat> they don't want a Savior because they don't think they need a Savior. Well, they don't need a Savior. Why? They're doing great. <coughs> Excuse me. They're doing fabulous. Look at all the progress they're making. Look at all that they have. Look how well things are. You know, one of the one of the, the curses that we actually have is prosperity. Because when we have prosperity, we don't think we need anything. So what do I need? I have everything. His Lord, the Lord came to his own, and his own received him not. But there is a positive note. Because John tells us that there were some, those who did receive him. It says in verse 12, But as many as received him, <clears throat> to them gave he the right or the authority to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The light was not only revealed and the light was not only resisted, but the light also by some was received. And John gives us here one of the most marvelous gospel texts that marks such a future feature of his, of his writing. We're going to see these over and over, these kind of gospel texts in his gospel. These verses, these two verses, believe it or not, these two verses are actually the essence of God's salvation. In a nutshell. Let's look at them. First of all, John describes the spiritual birth <clears throat> of a child of God. Verse 12 said, But as many has received him, to them he gave the right or the authority to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Now, human birth has two factors that interact in the equation of life. The human and the divine. The human beings do their part. And then God performs a miracle and life is created in the womb. <laughs> and then the child is born. And just like the natural birth so is the new birth, the spiritual birth. We do our part, 
God does His part, which is a miracle, and a life begins. Spiritual life, divine life, eternal life. A new child is born into the family of God. Now, the process revolves around three, verses, three verbs in this sentence. And in the Greek, actually, the word believe comes first, and then the word receive, and then the word become. So let's look at these. First of all, he says here, that we are to believe. What does it mean to believe? Well, one, it's interesting because this word in the original language, it, we translate it two different ways. It depends on if it's a noun or a verb. I suppose you weren't thinking we were going to have an English lesson today. That's all right. I didn't do real good in English, so this will be simple. If it's a verb, to believe. If it's a, and that you'll find all the way through the Gospel of John, believe, 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 believe. If it's the noun, we translate it faith in Romans. And you'll see all the way through the book of Romans, faith, faith, faith. So, back. What's this verb, believe me? Well, it means for us to put all of our faith and trust in something. I did this one time. I'm not, I thought about doing it again this morning, but I won't. But let's say that I had a chair here. <clears throat> let's say you brought the chair in, that I had never seen the chair before. I had no idea. You just said, oh, pastor, here's a chair for you. Sit down in the chair. And I look at the chair, and I think, well, it looks like a chair. I think it's a chair. But you know, I grew up in Southern California. And in Southern California, we have a, a little group of people who work in a place called Hollywood. And I actually lived in Burbank, where a lot of those people who work in Hollywood live. And some of those people would make things for the movie pictures. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but sometimes somebody in a movie will pick up a chair and bash it over somebody. Now, if that was a real chair, they'd need another actor. But you see, they make chairs to break. So you bring the chair in. And my mind says, I don't know if that's a real chair or not. But if I believe it is, I'm going to come over and I'm going to sit down in that chair. If I really believe in it, I'm going to raise both my feet off the ground when I sit down. I'm going to put all of my weight in that chair. But if I don't believe, if I don't have real faith, I'm going to kind of ease my way down. And I may never really sit in that chair. To believe is to put all of your faith in trust. But in what? In what? <clears throat> Some people believe in faith. They say, I have faith. What do you have faith in? Oh, I have faith in faith. <clears throat> well, good. I hate to tell you, that doesn't make any sense. Faith in faith. People love that expression. It doesn't mean anything. You have to have faith in something for it to be faith, to believe. And so, 
he says here, as many received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. His name. Why his name? Well, his name is the key to our salvation. Do you remember when Joseph was told by the angel that he was that Mary was going to have a son? He was also told the name that son. He said to him, "You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." You see, in the Hebrew, Jesus' names mean he is salvation. To believe in his name means to believe in everything his name signifies, everything his name means. It means that you're believing that he is truly God, that he truly came to earth, that he truly took on himself human flesh, that he truly went to the cross and died for you and rose again from the dead and that he is the real living Savior. Of course, we first need to recognize that we're sinners and have the need of a Savior or it doesn't mean anything. So we believe. But second, thing to believe in his name, but that in itself does not put us in the family of God. He says here, not only that, but we are to receive him. As many as receive him, he imparts new life. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is a Savior, or even that he is the Savior. A lot of people believe that Jesus is the Savior, but they're not saved. They don't know the Lord. They've not been born again. But what, you mean they believe, but they're still not saved? Right. You see, it's not just believing something. He says here you must receive it. I sometimes use this illustration when I'm sharing with somebody something. And <clears throat> I will say to them, look, you cannot earn your salvation. Uh, you can't do anything to get it. We'll talk about that a little bit later and stuff. But you do have to receive it. The Bible says that salvation is a free gift. It's the free gift of God. And so I'll take a pen and I'll say, I want to give you a gift. This is my gift to you. And I'm serious about it, by the way, when I do it. This is my gift to you. And um, here's my gift. And they reach out and they say, well, I need a dollar. <laughs> and they'll say, that's not free. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, here's my gift to you. Oh, okay. No, but you have to come to church. <laughs> well, that's not free either, is it? So then I hand it to him again and I say, this is my free gift to you. The only thing you need to do is what? You need to reach out and receive it. If you don't receive it, it's not yours. It's not. It's not. The only way we can have new life in Christ is when we believe in him and receive him. 
That means we invite Jesus, the only one who saves people from their sins, to come into our heart and life as our personal Lord and Savior. We believe and we receive. So how does believe and receive and make one a child of God? Well, that's our part. When we do our part, God then performs a miracle because notice he says, and those who believe in his name, but he says, those many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. We become a child of God. God imparts new life into the one who believes and the one who receives. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells the human spirit, brings him life of God. The life-giving power of God flows in and regenerates our human spirit. We have life from above. We become children of God. So what does it contain? We must believe, we must receive, and then God, as the Bible teaches, regenerates or saves our souls, gives us eternal life, gives us new life in Christ. We then become a child of God. And Don then describes the supernatural birth of the believer. He says in verse 13, who were not born of blood, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What's he mean? Well, first of all, this verse tells us that the new birth is not of human descent. That is not of blood. Some people, for some reason, believe that if their parents are saved, they're saved. I don't know how many times I have somebody tell, well, my, my parents are Christians, or my parents went to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. Somebody has said this, and I think it's a good statement. Think about this for a moment. God has no grandchildren. God only has children. You understand what he's saying? Every individual individually must come to know him. It's not because our parents were saved. It's not because of some other thing. It's not because of who we are or where we are born. The Jewish people believed because they were Jewish they were going to be saved. No. We in this country say, oh, well, we're not pagans. Yes, we are. If we don't know Christ. What's a pagan? What's a pagan? A non-believer. A non Amen. A non-believer in Jesus Christ. Second, this verse tells us that the new birth is not of human desire. He says, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. No amount of wishing, thinking, makes one a child of God. Now, I could, I could wish that I was born to a millionaire. <laughs> that doesn't make it so. And as far as I know, I wasn't. Maybe I should go back and find out who my original parents were. <laughs> Too late. And third of all, this verse tells us that the new birth is not of human design, nor of the will of man. No amount of parental or personal resolve can make a person a child of God. Our parents may have had us baptized as babies. I was. That didn't make me a child of God. Parent brings a child to church. That doesn't make them a child of God. 
raises them in a Christian home. That doesn't make them a child of God. Send them off to a Christian school. That doesn't make them a child of God. The will of man. We may try and live the best life we can. That doesn't make us a child of God. We may be as moral as we can be. That doesn't make us a child of God. We may be as good as we can be, but that doesn't make us a child of God. We may be as religious as we can, and that still does not make us a child of God. Those things do not impart new life. Only God can give us new life in Christ. We must be born of God. And that is the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you that in just a few simple verses, these tremendous the most important truths that we must know and believe and receive are wrapped up right here in what we've seen this morning. May we who know, may we who have the authority to proclaim that we are children of God, rejoice, give thanks, and sing and share with others what you have done in our lives for your glory. And Lord, for those who do not know, for those who maybe believe but have not received, for those who have not even believed, for those who want to remain in darkness. May thy spirit take thy word and do in their hearts and minds and will what only you can do. And draw them to thee, O Lord. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. If you would like to know Christ, you can go to our website. You can find there a place that you will click on. It will present the gospel to you. If you are here today and you say, I, you know, I, maybe I believe, but I haven't received, or I maybe don't even believe yet, we would love to be able to sit down and talk with you, take you through God's word, answer your questions, that you might come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'll be out the door after the service. Just come by and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk with you. Or somebody else here in the congregation. I know they'd be glad to talk with you.